Welcome back to Organized, the Business Law Breakdown. I'm Seth C. Orenberg, a professor of law, and today we're kicking off a deep dive into one of the most fundamental concepts in contract law, the promise. In our prequel, we talked about three pillars of contracts, offer, acceptance, and consideration. But none of these make sense without understanding what comes first, the promise. The promise is the building block of every contract. But here's something to think about. We make promises every day. How do some promises become more than just words? When does a simple statement turn into a legally binding obligation that would hold up in court? Last time, we set the stage by introducing the idea that promises are at the heart of contracts. We touched on how promises become binding, but today we're going to dig deeper and get into the nuances that courts look at when deciding which promises should be legally enforced and which are just words. In this episode, we'll explore the key elements that make a promise legally binding. What separates a casual commitment from a serious commitment? We'll use the case of Steinberg versus Chicago Medical School to see how a simple admissions brochure became a promise with legal consequences. We'll also tackle some hypothetical situations and a problem from my casebook to illustrate how courts treat promises in different contexts. You'll learn about what courts look for, clear intent, definitive terms, and reliance. Whether you're a law student trying to master contract doctrine, a business professional who makes deals every day, or a practicing lawyer navigating contractual obligations, today's episode will give you tools to understand what makes promises legally binding. So. If you've ever wondered why certain promises carry the weight of law while others don't, stick around. We'll be breaking down real world cases, working through practical problems, and using pop culture references to make sure these concepts stick. By the end of this episode, you'll know what it takes for a promise to hold up in court, and you'll know why it is critical for anyone entering into an agreement to understand the power of promises under law. A promise in legal terms is much more than just a casual statement or offhand remark. A promise becomes the foundation of any contract when it carries intent, clarity, and the expectation that it will be relied upon. But what separates a legally binding promise from a mere verbal commitment? According to the Restatement Second of Contracts, a promise is defined as a manifestation of intention to act or refrain from acting in a specified way, so made as to justify a promisee in understanding that a commitment has been made. Let's break that down. This means that for a promise to be legally enforceable, there are three key elements courts look for. First, clear intention. The person making the promise, known as the promisor, must intend for their commitment to be taken seriously and relied upon. Imagine that a friend casually tells you, I'll buy you coffee next week while you're chatting at a cafe. Is that a legally binding promise? Most likely not, because it's a casual, friendly statement and both parties understand it's not meant to create a serious legal obligation. Now, compare that to a business context where one party sends the other a written document saying, we will deliver 500 units of product by next Friday at a price of $10 per unit. Here, the intent to be legally bound is clear, and the promise or statement would more likely be treated as a binding promise. Next, we have definitiveness. For a promise to be legally enforceable, the terms must be specific and clear. The court enforce vague or ambiguous promises. For example, if I say, I promise to give you something valuable in the future, that's not a legally binding promise. Too vague. What's something valuable? The courts need clarity to enforce a promise. Now consider a different example. If I promise to sell you my car for $10,000 by the end of the month, that's specific. The court would likely find there to be a legally binding promise because the terms are clear. What I'm promising, how much it costs, and when it will happen. Finally, let's talk about reliance. This is where the person receiving the promise needs to rely on the promise in a way that makes it reasonable to expect the promise will be enforced. 
if the would reasonably change their position or take some action or inaction based on the promise that strengthens the case for enforcement. Think about the Steinberg case, where a student applied to a medical school, believing that his application would be reviewed fairly based on academic merit. Steinberg paid an application fee and relied on the school's promise to evaluate him fairly. And this became the key point of contention in court. His reliance on that promise is what pushed the court to recognize the brochure as a binding commitment rather than mere advertising language. These three elements, clear intention, definitiveness, and reliance are essential for distinguishing a promise from a casual statement. Without them, courts can't enforce promises and people would never be sure which commitments really matter. Understanding these elements helps us see why some promises carry the weight of law while others remain words. As we go through this episode, we'll look at real-world examples of promises and work through cases where courts had to decide whether a promise should be legally enforceable. By the end, you'll have a solid understanding of what makes a promise binding in the eyes of the law. Now let's break it down by analyzing the Steinberg versus Chicago Medical School case, a foundational case that illustrates how promises can become legally binding. This case delves into the relationship between a promise, reliance, and the obligations that arise from them. Here's the situation. Robert Steinberg applied to the Chicago Medical School, paid an application fee, and relied on the school's admissions brochure, which stated that applicants would be evaluated based on academic qualifications, such as grades and test scores. Steinberg, like other applicants, assumed that by submitting his application, the school would follow through on its commitment to review his file based on these criteria. The crux of the case rested on whether the school's admission brochure was just a piece of marketing or a legally enforceable promise. Steinberg alleged that Chicago Medical School was using other criteria, like family connections and the ability to make donations to the school in the future, as opposed to the criteria it put in its brochure. So, was the brochure a promise? Let's think about that for a second. Does a brochure, something that seems so routine, have the power to create legal obligations? The court said yes, but why? The brochure contains specific language, outlining the criteria on which applicants would be judged. Steinberg relied on this information and applied to the school, paying his application fee in the process. In the court's view, this set of facts amounted to more than just casual marketing. By accepting the fee, the school was implicitly agreeing to adhere to the terms laid out in the brochure. The brochure, therefore, became an offer to evaluate applicants under specific conditions, and Steinberg's application and fee acted as an acceptance of that offer. The brochure, therefore, became a proposal for offers. Steinberg made the offer under these terms when he sent in his application along with a check for the fee, and Chicago Medical School accepted Steinberg's offer and these terms when it cashed his check. In essence, the court ruled that the admissions brochure contained a definite and clear promise, one that the school intended to be relied upon by applicants. This case is a great example of how statements that can seem innocuous can, under certain circumstances, be binding legal promises. The lesson here is that institutions like schools need to be cautious about the language they use in communications, especially when money and expectations are involved. Reliance is another element here. Steinberg didn't just read the brochure and walk away. He acted on it. He paid a fee and submitted an application fully expecting his application would be reviewed on academic merit, just as the school promised in its brochure. This kind of reliance is important because, as we discussed earlier, it's one of the core elements of an enforceable promise. Imagine for a moment that the school hadn't mentioned any admissions criteria at all. What if the brochure simply said, apply to our school, and had no other details? In that case, Steinberg wouldn't have any specific criteria to rely on, making it harder to claim that a binding promise had been made. But because the school spelled out the criteria clearly, Steinberg's reliance on those terms was reasonable and justified. This reliance was the turning point for this court. The court found that Steinberg had not only relied on the promise, but that his reliance was reasonable. Steinberg took concrete steps, paying money 
and writing an application based on the school's promise. Courts take reliance seriously because it shows that a promise has real consequences. And when a party changes their position based on a promise, it strengthens the argument that the promise should be enforced. The case has broader implications for how businesses, educational institutions, and even individuals communicate their commitments. The takeaway here is simple. Be careful what you promise. Even in seemingly routine documents like brochures, advertisements, or business emails, if someone can reasonably rely on your words to their detriment, you might be creating a legally enforceable promise without realizing it. For example, think of a real estate listing that says, this house has ocean views. If someone buys that house expecting an ocean view and it turns out the view is obstructed, the seller could be held accountable. Just like in the Steinberg case, clear statements in marketing materials can sometimes cross the line into binding promises if people rely on them. But what if the advertisement says, this house has amazing views? That might be harder to enforce because it's a vague statement. In contract law, we learn that promises don't always have to be formalized in a signed agreement to become enforceable. As we see with Steinberg, the school may not have intended to create a binding contract with every applicant through its admissions brochure, but the court ruled that it still did. This case highlights how words can become law, whether or not the party making the promise intended that outcome. So why does this case matter? The Steinberg case is a prime example of how ordinary communications, brochures, advertisements, business offers, can evolve into binding promises where they meet the criteria of clarity, intent, and reliance. Steinberg teaches that business, schools, individuals, and other institutions must be careful when crafting communications because people might rely on it when making decisions. It's easy to assume that only formal contracts create legal obligations, but cases like this show that promises, if they meet certain conditions, can hold up in court and create legal consequences for both parties. Let's play a quick what if. Imagine if Chicago Medical School's brochure had stated that admissions decisions would be made on a holistic basis without specifying any clear criteria for evaluation. Would that still count as a legally enforceable promise? In this case, the lack of specific terms would likely prevent it from being considered a binding promise. Remember, one of the key elements of a legally enforceable promise is definitiveness. The terms must be clear enough for both parties to understand exactly what's being promised. Without clear criteria, a holistic admissions promise might be too vague to be enforced because it leaves too much room for interpretation. The court would have a hard time determining what the school actually promised in concrete terms making it much harder to claim a binding promise was made. Now, let's take this a step further. What if the school had included specific criteria but added a, dis a disclaimer saying they reserve the right to consider other factors like ability to make financial contributions alongside academic merit? In this case, the promise is weakened by the disclaimer. The school's right to consider additional factors creates uncertainty for the applicants and undermines the idea that academic merit is the sole basis for acceptance. This kind of flexibility would reduce the applicant's ability to reasonably rely on the promise, making it less likely to be enforceable. This scenario emphasizes that disclaimers or vague terms can weaken the enforceability of a promise. Courts are much more likely to enforce promises that are clear, specific, and leave little room for ambiguity. This highlights an important point. Clarity and definitiveness are key to making a promise enforceable. Vague promises or promises with built-in loopholes are difficult for courts to enforce because they don't give the other party a clear understanding of what's expected. Without that, it's hard to hold someone accountable for not following through. That's why in contract law, specificity is crucial. The clearer and more detailed the promise, the more likely it is to create a legal obligation. In our everyday lives and in business transactions, it's critical to ensure promises are explicit and well-defined if we expect them to hold up in court. In the TV show Suits, promises play a big role in shaping business deals and legal disputes. 
One memorable example is when Mike Ross, the main character, is hired by Harvey Specter, despite not being a licensed lawyer. The entire premise of this arrangement rests on Harvey's promise to keep Mike secret, a promise that is not legally enforceable because it's illegal, but carries significant personal and professional consequences. What's interesting about this situation is that while Harvey's promise to Mike isn't legally binding because it violates ethical and legal boundaries, it still creates an obligation that both characters honor throughout this series. This highlights a broader point. Although not all promises are enforceable in court, they can still create personal or social expectations that matter in real life. Suits shows us how promises can shape relationships and drive decisions, even when they aren't legally binding. The takeaway here is that while we're focused on legally enforceable promises in contract law, we shouldn't ignore the impact of informal promises and how they influence behavior and decisions in the real world. Even if Harvey and Mike's secret wouldn't hold up in court, the consequences of breaking that promise are very real for them. Let's recap what we covered today. We started by exploring the concept of a promise and what makes it legally binding. Promise isn't just a casual statement. It becomes enforceable when it's made with clear intention to be bound, when the terms are definitive, and when someone reasonably relies on it. We analyzed the Steinberg or Chicago Medical School case where admissions brochure created a legally enforceable promise that the school would evaluate applicants based on academic merit. This case illustrated how even routine statements can turn into binding commitments if they meet the criteria of a promise. We also tackled some hypotheticals in our what if segment, showing how vague promises or those with disclaimers might not hold up in court. Finally, we used a pop culture example from Suits to demonstrate how informal promises, though not legally binding, can still have serious personal and professional consequences. The key takeaway? Clarity and reliance are essential for making promises enforceable in contract law. Whether you're drafting contracts, managing business deals, or even negotiating in your personal life, the more specific your promises, the more likely they are to hold up in court. Before we wrap up, take a moment to reflect on how promises play a role in your own life, whether in business, law, or personal commitments. Have you made promises that you think would hold up in court? If you're a law student or a professional, how do these legal concepts impact the contracts or agreements you're working on? I'd love to hear from you. If you have questions, comments, or even your own what-if scenario, feel free to reach out and share your thoughts using the comments in this podcast. Engaging with your ideas helps sh shape future episodes and brings real-world relevance to these concepts. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast, leave a review if you're enjoying the show so far, and share it with others who might find it useful. And don't miss the next episode, where we'll be diving into the concept of capacity and incapacity in contract law, a key issue when determining who is legally able to form a contract. That's all for today's episode of Organized, the business law breakdown. I'm Seth C. Orenberg, and I want to thank you for tuning in and exploring the fascinating world of promises with me today. I hope you found it informative and helpful. Remember, until next time, keep your agreement strong and your arguments stronger.